Okay, and welcome back. I hope you'll indulge me for a minute here. Uh, I don't really like to talk about current events, but let's just say I think current events today have a lot of people down. <laughs> I think there is a lot of general anxiety in the world uh, because of current events. And people just think like it, it can't possibly get worse. And this is where a study in history can be your aid. Because when you study history, that's when you get the comforting assurance that, oh yeah, things can get a heck of a lot worse. And that comparatively, today is not so bad. You look around and I know it looks like a total crap frest uh, in terms of politics and society and current events but trust me people it can get a lot worse than this and all you need to do is turn to history to uh see that that's the case so and this is actually relevant to our lecture today uh and so let's talk about it so you remember uh the protestant reformation we've talked about the protestant reformation and the counter-reformation that came out of the council of trent basically Protestants split from Catholics, and it wasn't just uh, all pilgrims and Thanksgiving parties and stuff like that. Oh no, it was a very, very violent affair. Uh, Protestants saw Catholics as uh, individuals who followed uh, uh, Antichrist, the Pope, and they actually uh, smashed Catholic art, windows, etc., as we see in this uh, famous example the very famous image storm uh, that happened in Antwerp. Uh, Catholics, for their part, uh, reciprocated, and we unleashed nearly 150 years of really horrendous uh, sectarian violence in Europe. The worst phase of this happened during the so-called Thirty Years' War. Uh, the Thirty Years' War was mostly fought in Eastern Europe, and it was fought between two large parties. You have the Spaniards on one side, and you have the Holy Roman Empire on one side, both controlled by the Habsburgs. And then you had Sweden, Denmark, some northern countries, some German provinces on the other side that were allied with France. And the battle was between Catholics and Protestants. And you're saying, okay, so why was France on that side? Well, France, despite being Catholic, had a very strong monarchy and really didn't want to be swallowed up by the Holy Roman Empire. Long story short, what happened is Protestantism uh, arose and refused to be put under the rule of Catholic monarchs. Some monarchs actually converted to Protestantism, and now you have a huge problem. Protestants that were being persecuted by Catholics called out to Protestant kings to come to their aid. Uh, Catholics and uh, uh, Protestant countries called out to the Holy Roman Empire, the Spaniards, to come to their aid, and everything just went to pot. To give you a sense of it, more people died in Europe in the Thirty Years' War than, in Eastern Europe at least, died, than died under the Black Death. Now I want you to focus on that. And the Black Death happens in the 14th century, 1348, 1349, and estimates are that one out of every three people, maybe 20 million people, died in that episode. And more people were killed in the Thirty Years' War in Eastern Europe than died in the Black Death. Except they weren't killed by disease or some just random plague that came by. Uh, they were killed deliberately by atrocities. Uh, either forced to convert, and if not convert, then hung, as you see in this lovely picture here. And there were many, many, many such examples and atrocities. Now, a lot of this atrocity was done in the name of religion, but oftentimes, as it always does, politics gets involved. A lot of these rulers, you know, said they were going to the aid of their fellow co-religionists in another country, when in reality it was just a, a land grab. Politics always gets mixed up with religion. But religion was the impetus, religion was the excuse that made it happen. Eventually, though, uh, something good came out of it, and that is Europe had had enough of blood 
that they decided to step back from the edge. It's really one of the few cases where it actually happened in human history. And this is where we enter into what's known as the Peace of uh, Westphalia. Uh, basically, what happened, you have the Treaty of Onnesbruck and the Treaty of Munster, and they come together to agree to recognize each other's borders, and that it's the king who gets to decide what the state religion is in his country, and that if the Protestants don't like that, they can leave. If the Catholics don't like that, they can leave. And that no other country is going to violate their borders. Their borders and their countries are going to be sovereign. And we're not going to have a relationship of, you know, defenders of one religion against another. If we're going to have wars, we're going to have them about the political things, about resources and borders. And it's going to be a, na a system of states, of nation states. Now, what this does in the long run is it elevates secular government over religious government and over religious concerns. And it moves Europe dramatically into the direction of secularism for its own self-interest, that you know we're going to separate the religious powers from the secular powers just because we don't want to be beholden to all of these religious wars and these fundamentalist nut jobs who are constantly getting us into these fights. And this causes an opening in European society for a time period that we call the Enlightenment. That is, you have a number of scholars who come along who basically say, hey, maybe we need to rethink how we've ordered society. And it affects every level of society. It affects the sciences, it affects political philosophy, it affects economics. And this period from about the second half of the 17th century all the way up into the 18th century, we call the Enlightenment, or we call it the Age of Reason. One of the points that it's supposed to have sparked it off is the very famous quote, Cogito ergo sum, or I think therefore uh, I am, by the very famous French uh, polymath and philosopher René Descartes. René Descartes made this quote, and it shows you, it's a great quote to include, because it explains the whole era. The idea was to put thought and reason above passion and belief, and that it was going to be an era governed by reason. And it has a lot of advantages to society, politically, socially, everything else. We are still basking in the glow of the Enlightenment to a certain degree. Now, that doesn't mean it was all good, uh, there was plenty of bad that happened to the Enlightenment. This was the era of the height of the Atlantic slave trade. What's amazing is in the middle of the Atlantic slave trade, uh, here was Europe having an Enlightenment, having a discussion about the equality and the rights of men, but somehow those never quite extended to women or people of color. <laughs> but they would get there eventually. Uh, eventually people would, even Voltaire would come around and say, well, maybe even Turks are, you know, equal to us and are part of the human family. So it was the beginning of this kind of idea of a universal brotherhood of man in some way, uh, even though it was more often uh, uh, not honored. Uh, there was at least this idea towards it. So like all ages, all historical ages, it was an age of contradictions. But at least from the perspective of Europe, it was a huge advancement forward. And you have figures and thinkers like John Locke. John Locke, who gave his ideas to Thomas Jefferson, who created, of course, the Declaration of Independence, and also uh, passed that information down to James Madison, who's the, uh, you know, the father of the USS Constitution. And this gives us the Bill of Rights and the idea that people ought to have freedom of rights. Uh, Voltaire, who was an ardent, who was a French uh, thinker, who was an ardent defender of freedom of speech. You also have people uh, discussing the nature of government. Uh, and the nature of reality, from Immanuel Kant to um, Rousseau, what was the nature of man, what was man's life like. Uh, there were thinkers all over the continent. The main areas of thinkers are going to be in England, France, and America. Uh, uh, well, I guess England and France, America by extension of England in a way. Uh, and this radically changes everything. So let's talk about a few areas where this changes life and how this impacts the arts at the time. Okay, so the perennial headline of history is humans suck. You can put that right under the masthead in uh, 72 point, uh, you know, 
block text. <laughs> Humans suck. And if the Enlightenment had a point, the Enlightenment was maybe we can suck less. <laughs> maybe we can build on this idea of humanism founded during the Renaissance, and we can actually progress and advance in our knowledge. We can advance in our morals. And the three areas this is going to impact us the most are going to be the scientific revolution, political or democratic revolutions, and this rise of antiquarianism. That's the big one for us in art history. But let's talk about the scientific revolution first. There's so many figures we could talk about the scientific revolution that happens from Copernicus to Kepler to Galileo uh, all the way up to Isaac Newton. I'm just going to focus on Isaac Newton because he is kind of a personification of this ideal and he happens right in the middle of this. Isaac Newton, of course, is an English natural philosopher. That's what he would have been called, not a scientist. And he writes in 1687, uh, uh, the natural philosophy of mathematic principles, or mathematical principles of natural philosophy. And this is the book that fundamentally changes the world and its understanding of the universe. It's what introduces classical mechanics. It explains why the planets move the way they do. It develops the theory of gravity. Uh, and he did a lot of things. Oh my gosh, uh, Isaac Newton advanced, of course. He, he along with uh, Leibniz, invented uh, calculus. He also did uh, advanced work on optics, as you can see it here. But it's this work, this, you know, uh, Principia Mathematica, that really cements his reputation. And it also changes how people see the world. It ushers in a belief in the world as a kind of ordered clockwork universe, that the universe is governed by laws that we can understand, and that this allows us to manipulate the universe in our favor. And this allows us to expand our understanding and knowledge. Now, Isaac Newton, for his part, was deeply Christian, and so he thought this was the work of God, and so that's how he saw it and interpreted it. But uh, others saw it as an invitation to atheism, that why do we need a God if the universe runs by itself? But either way, it creates this idea of order, that the universe is one of order. And you see this impact of the scientific revolution directly in the arts. And I've talked about this painting before, but it's one of my favorites because it really highlights this. Uh, one of the things that was also being developed at the time was modern chemistry. Alchemy was giving way to advanced modern chemistry. People were isolating out the elements. They were developing theories of how the world works. They were isolating out chemicals like oxygen, etc. cetera. Uh, really kind of amazing stuff. And they were going around doing, you know, natural experiments, natural philosophical experiments in colleges and other locations, uh, in lecture halls all over. And so this stuff was cutting edge and it was really exciting. So here we have a depiction of the demonstration of an air pump. And I know as silly as this sounds to us, what we're seeing here is a demonstration of how science has proved that air has substance. I mean, we don't think about air. Air is what we live in, but we breathe it. We need it to live. And one of the proofs that they used to demonstrate this was they would take a pump, suck all the air out of this chamber. And of course, there would be a bird. In this case, it's a dove that you can see. Let me just grab my pen. You can see... Uh, the dove right here, and he's in the air chamber, and the air is being sucked out by this device. And of course, the dove will die, proving that yes, we need air. I know that sounds like a, you know, really kind of third grade uh, science experiment, but at this stage, it was cutting edge. What I love is that you have the assistant here raising the bird cage back up because he knows it will not be needed because the bird is not going to survive that. But look at how this is depicted. The wild hair person here, he isn't a prophet or a religious figure, he is a scientist. The scientist is the source of knowledge. Totally shifts uh, the world on us. Instead of religion being the source of knowledge. And even though we have this wonderful kind of illumination here, is, is, this is the illumination of science. We have a wide char uh, cast of characters that are gathered here. From this man who is older, uh, looking on pensive, we have people who are uh, of various different age groups. My favorite are the two little girls. 
Uh, so even girls should be exposed to science, although they don't seem to be taking it too well because the bird is dying. And I love the father consoling them, saying, oh no, it's educational, don't worry about this. <laughs> but this is such a fabulous painting because it demonstrates how there was this now new reverence for science. And science gave people a way of understanding the universe in the 18th century. They could understand it as ordered, as a clockwork mechanism, and that this was how you could understand the universe, and because of that, things could get better. It's hard to underestimate how much Newton changed the paradigm for how we think about the world. And one of my favorite examples of this is this. This is a cenotaph. A cenotaph is a memorial piece of architecture. This one is designed uh, by Etienne Louis uh, Bouet. Uh, Bouet uh, was this really uh, amazing architect. And he loved to do architectural fantasies that were beyond the technical times, uh, beyond the technical ability of people at the time. Uh, and this was his proposed cenotaph, uh, cenotaph for Isaac Newton. And you would enter into this magnificent sphere, and this thing is bigger than the pyramids at Giza, but you would enter into it, you would go down a long tunnel, you would come up to a platform, and then the holes uh, in the sphere were drilled into the sphere to allow sunlight to come in to mimic the starry sky at night. So these are thousands of little windows that would let in just a light to come in. So you would have the experience of walking into this uh, in complete darkness and going in and seeing the night sky in the middle of a brilliant day. And then, of course, uh, during the night, uh, there was a huge armillary or orrery that depicted uh, the planets of the sun that would light up on the interior. So you would have day during night and night during day would have been an amazing thing. Again, completely beyond anybody's ability to actually construct at the time. But it shows how important these characters were, that Isaac Newton had essentially opened up the heavens to us. He had given us a way of understanding the universe. And so what better way to commemorate him in a memorial structure than to display the universe? He told us how the planets and stars uh, actually move, and he gave us formulas that could actually predict that. Brilliant stuff. So I love this because it gives us a sense of how this actually impacted society at the time. We went from a society from thinking, you know, we may, we'll never understand the universe. The universe is kind of a mystery to uh, a worldview. It's like, yeah, we, we could understand the universe. We can make sense of it all. The second thing that uh, the Enlightenment gave us was, of course, a complete set of political revolutions that people began to think that, no, wait a minute, this system of being ruled by kings and emperors is, you know, it's worked for Europe for a while, but it has its drawbacks. You can't really check the emperor. Uh, the emperor has too much power. Uh, you have John Locke talking about ideas of, uh, you know, checks and balances in government. And this caused a whole series of upheavals in society, starting with probably the Glorious Revolution uh, in England that you know, basically closed out a long period of civil war and political turmoil in England, but increased the rights of individuals and increased the power of the parliament against the king. Uh, and of course, in France, you have this wonderful scene painted by Jacques-Louis David, uh, which is the tennis court oath. Basically, France was divided into estates. Estates were uh, classes and segments of society. At the top, you had uh, the nobility and the aristocracy, then you had the church, but the other estate was ordinary people, merchant class, etc. And in theory, the king was supposed to respond and, uh, you know, balance the uh, ideas of all of these uh, groups of society. But at a gathering at Versailles, uh, the third estate was actually closed out uh, from meetings, or at least that was the rumor that it was closed out from meetings. And so they had nowhere to meet. So they ran to a local tennis court, yes, an actual tennis court, and swore an oath. And this has the same importance to the French Revolution as 
the Declaration of Independence would have to the American Revolution. So I'm speaking probably mostly to my American students. I know I have people listening in from all over. But to my American students, you should recognize the American Revolution. You have this guy, Thomas Jefferson, who writes the Declaration of Independence, and they separate themselves. But the Declaration of Independence sets out the terms for how a society is supposed to be organized. It's not supposed to be organized from kings on down. It's supposed to be organized from the bottom up, that you have the consent of the governed that, you know, give power to states. And if that consent isn't respected, well, then they have a right to revolt. It also sets out the principles of American ideals, that all men are created equal. Now, again, not always exercised. It was very clear that, you know, well, of course that didn't extend to women and, and slaves, but eventually people would say, why doesn't that extend to women and slaves? And so those principles were laid down. So the tennis court orth was, uh, for those of you who don't know French history, was very much a, a similar moment, a moment that, you know, kind of sparked off what would become the French Revolution. Now, the American Revolution and the French Revolution end up going, taking very different routes uh, and have very different strategies, but they were both outgrowths of this idea of the Enlightenment that people uh, were at least... Certain classes of people should have the right to self-determination and their society. And a lot of this also drew on classical antiquity. The belief that, you know, hey, originally Athens was a democracy. Originally Rome was a republic. And so maybe we should emulate these ancient institutions. Uh, we have a senate in America. We have a veto in America. Those are all Latin terms that are borrowed from classical history that are integrated into our idea of governance and jurisprudence. So in addition to the scientific uh, revolution and in addition to the democratic revolution, we also have a revolution of antiquarianism. And that is where this finally gets us to something that's a lot closer related to art history. Uh, a lot of these ideas, the scientific revolution was sparked by classical philosophy, the democratic revolutions were, sponsored, uh, were, uh, were a response to looking at classical institutions that had democracy, and so it makes sense that we would also look to antiquity for a kind of revolution in the arts, or if not a revolution, a kind of revival, uh, because we were going back to the past, so it's more reactionary, it's not so much a revolution as it is a way of reviving something. And so you have individuals, and he's not the only one, but we have individuals like uh, Winkelmann. Winkelmann uh, was one of these great, uh, you know, foundational scholars of art history, and he wrote the very famous The History of Art in Antiquity. So this is an incredible influence on people. But this is also the time period where these collections, these academies that have formed, under kings and queens and other institutions start to be opened up to the public. In fact, the first public museum in the world is the British Museum, and it's truly a public museum. It was a collection that in 1753 sought to make all of these collections available. It started out as a donated collection from a bunch of British lords that eventually became public and eventually became this public institution. People could go see this. And Winkelmann's ideas were translated into many different languages, French, English, um, Italian. These were printed throughout the world, and people started to have a greater interest in classical antiquity. And the interest in classical antiquity aligned perfectly with this idea of an ordered universe that came out of the scientific revolution, and also this idea of a world governed by law, and by the consent of the governed. Because when you look back to these classical institutions and classical architecture, it seemed to have these qualities. These were uh, architecture, this was architecture of order and reason. And so it aligned with this. You have, of course, Lord Elgin uh, goes to the Parthenon <laughs> and he steals the marbles from the Parthenon. Uh, they were under Ottoman, uh, Athens was under Ottoman control at that time, so the Ottomans let him uh, purchase them, but in reality he really didn't have any right to them. Uh, Greece still wants them back, and so that's why these great relics of Greek civilization were brought to the British Museum, and this happened in the 18th century, and they were put on view, and that's why they're in the British Museum today. And so they were looking at, you know, saying, hey, we're trying to create more democratic, reasonable societies, what better thing to emulate than 
Greek civilization and the height of Greek civilization, which was a democracy, which built all of this great art. So you can see how there's synergy here. There's total synergy here. And it explains why they move in the direction to create a new classical age. That's exactly what neoclassicism means, a new classical age. That was their goal. They were moving in this direction because the scientific revolution, the political revolutions, the Age of Enlightenment was moving in that way, and this art just seemed to fit. So there's a reason why the great museums of the world are built in a classical style. Because they are trying to recapture something of that glory that existed in the past and say, hey, we're like them. The Greeks, the Romans, they valued law, they valued order, they valued democracy and republics and systems of government and checks and balances, but they also valued science, advancement, and all those other things. So we're going to emulate their art to say, hey, we're a new classical age in that vein. So when you look at something like the front of the British Museum, it has classical pediments, it has ionic uh, you know, columns and order. It perfectly makes sense. And the same could be said of American art, that when you look at the architecture of the American Capitol, particularly the White House, the Capitol building, it's all classical. Because America got its start at this time. America as an institution, as a political entity, had its birth in the middle of this neoclassical moment, and so it completely embraced this. And so we shouldn't be surprised that when we look at things like Bullfinch's original design for the Capitol, now it's been expanded, had it wings added to it, and the Capitol has been raised uh, after this, but at least in its initial uh, you know, creation, it was entirely classical. There's classical pediments, classical pilasters, classical columns uh, that are Corinthian capitals. If you actually get close to these, though, it's fun because... Corinthian capitals are based on acanthus leaves, and if you actually go and look around uh, Washington, D.C., you'll find that while they're Corinthian capitals, the foliage in those is not acanthus leaf, which is a Mediterranean plant. They're actually based on things like um, corn and tobacco, which were North American uh, plants. So there's a little bit of Americanism, there's a little bit of American pride in our agricultural, our unique agricultural products uh, that are placed there. And so you can see why this all gels. Uh, and so there's a couple of things going on here. One is the hangover from the Rococo. The Rococo was so heavily invested in the aristocracy. It was so heavily invested in this decadent, light subject matter that people just turned away from it. It was like, it's like, I, I just have to have something solid. It's like, I need a whole grain bagel after I've just had you know, days of, you know, heavy frosted wedding cake. I need something. <laughs> I need a cleanse. I need a cleanse. I need to get something more substantial, more pure. You know, if, you, if all you've had for days is Red Bull and uh, uh, pure sugar and pure caffeine, you need to come down. You need, you need to eat your kale. You need to have a whole grain bagel because uh, otherwise you're not going to get through it. So in a way, neoclassicism was that. It was far more restrained. It was far more ordered. It gave a promise of order, dignity, simplicity. And it wasn't so light and frothy. It wasn't just uh, pure sugar. It wasn't just decadence. It actually had some meat. Uh, it actually had some substance uh, that it was about serious things like, you know, civilization law, order, what are the rights of man, those kind of things. So it had that. So we were getting over the hangover of the excesses of, say, the Baroque and the Rococo era. So we we're getting over those excesses. But it also perfectly gelled with the new ideas of the time, that if we needed an architecture or an art form that explained to us what it was we were trying to do in the Enlightenment, Classical architecture fit the bill perfectly, and so we jumped in and we embraced it. And that's why we have this neoclassical age. Basically, from in art terms, from the second half of the 18th century up into about the first quarter of the 19th century. And so that's where we are. So let's take a look at how some of this unfolds. Let's take a look at some concrete examples. So let's start talking about you know painting in England. Uh, we start with Thomas Gainsborough. Thomas Gainsborough is probably the preeminent English painter of the 18th century, and he's uh, predominantly a portraitist. He crosses that boundary 
between the Rococo and the neoclassical age. In fact, it's, it's very hard for people to typify him because he often moves over into the neoclassical. He really specializes in portraits of English gentry. And by gentry, we mean gentry are people who are wealthy, successful, have large tracts of land. Uh, bonus points to anybody who caught that reference. Uh, and, but they are not necessarily nobles. So these are nouveau riche. These are people who are up and comers in society. And so when he paints them, some of those like earliest portraits, there's a really interesting sensibility to these portraits. Uh, there's a love of nature. These are landed gentry. These are people who have land and title, uh, excuse me, title to the land, not like nobility titles, not that way. And so he wants to show them and their wealth. And what better way to demonstrate wealth than by land? And so not surprisingly, these paintings show huge tracts of land. So we have large open areas. Now in this way, he reveals his Rococo sensibilities because like the French Rococo painters, every leaf is painted here. Every grain of, uh, is painted. Uh, also, we have fabulous uh, details in the silk, delicate faces, etc. going on here. So there's a lot going on here that feels very much like the French Rococo. But instead of people decadently involved in kind of sex play or uh, etc., it's a bit more toned down. It has a lot more British reserve. The figures look directly at us. Uh, they're respectable. This is a, a respectable upper middle class portrait for that reason. And the emphasis on nature is not just to show off the skill of the artist, but there's a genuine respect for nature. Uh, this is the time of the development of the British garden. British gardens are very, very different. And British landscaping is very, very different than French landscaping. If you recall Versailles, everything was perfectly geometrically ordered. But English landscaping, English always have a very different relationship to their, to their countryside, and they like the countryside to look natural. Maybe not be natural, but look natural. There's a very famous quote that uh, an English uh, gardener will, you know, spend hours torturing his uh, garden into something that looks natural, which of course is absurd, because if it's natural, you should just let it go. Uh, a lot of this is coming from influence from Chinese and Japanese gardens, and from Eastern gardens, where the goal is not to uh, impose yourself on nature, but to allow nature to help nature to show off its best in miniature. And so you have a kind of more natural feel. And so this British reserve and British, you know, you know, kind of stiff upper lip quality comes out in this, which means that his Rococo is, Rococo is never going to be as over the top as the French. Notice that there's a little unfinished section here uh, that maybe there was an intent that a child would be painted there at some future date. Uh, so they had aspirations of, of having children. He even paints himself this way. So this is himself um, with his daughter and his wife. And again, notice that we have the typical gray English skies. Every leaf is painted, but it's a chance to show themselves in nature uh, and appreciating nature. And again, that's an enlightenment idea, this idea that we can learn from nature, we can observe nature and learn nature. So this isn't twisted and contorted to fit some narrative, as you might see in a Fragonard. Instead, it allows things to be as they are. Lovely piece, absolutely incredible. I love the, the detail of this, all of the detail. This is where the Rococo influence comes off. But instead, we have people out for a morning walk. And we have this wonderful kind of reserved scene. He's probably most famous for this painting, The Blue Boy, which I think is kind of atypical of his work. So you can see this, you know, wonderful love of surface that exists in the Rococo, but there's going to be far more reserve and far more uh, contemplation in a Gainsborough. Uh, and that's, again, coming out of this kind of enlightenment ideal. Um, we're going to... Uh, you know, allow our figures to be rational. This even shows up in another painter's work. This is Hogarth. Uh, Hogarth is a painter of satirical scenes, but also a, a famous painter of the time. But what I love about his scenes is that uh, while they're a little bit more to the risque side, while they're a little bit more to the uh, sexual innuendo and uh, 
funniness and decadence of the French Rococo, they still kind of have a, a more moral point, a more rational point. This one is from a series of paintings about modern marriage, and you can see how Hogarth is incredibly uh, critical of modern marriage. This is the young couple uh, to be betrothed, uh, but you'll notice that the young man isn't interested in her at all. He's instead turning to his snuff box. <laughs> uh, we have these two dogs that are chained together. Boy, is that a metaphor for an unhappy marriage. Uh, she has a ring tied around uh, a handkerchief, perhaps a pledge from another man. So you can tell she is not happy with this marriage. So what is going on? What we see is the negotiation of a marriage, and it comes down to to just pure cost. Here you see this rich noble, well, he's not a rich nobleman. You see this nobleman and he is pointing to his lineage saying, I have lineage, I have pedigree. But you'll notice he has gout. Gout was considered a rich man's disease because he ate too many, uh, you know, uh, processed meats. And instead he is forced to enter into a marriage with the daughter of one of these nouveau riches who may not be as noble. And so we have all these busybodies who are making the marriage contract, negotiating the price and the dowry, sharpening their pens, uh, while all of the uh, ancestors look on in horror as to what has befallen the family. So this is a very satirical look at modern customs and modern marriage. And in that way, it fits very much in with kind of enlightenment ideas, this kind of a cynical takedown, but it can also be very fun. The next painter we're going to look at is Joshua Reynolds. By the time we get to Joshua Reynolds, we're going to see a much stronger shift towards neoclassicism, away from the delicate nature of the Rococo to things that are much stronger, much tightly, much more tightly composed, and have clear classical uh, allusions built into them. He is a portraitist of both gentry, but also nobility, and he's also the chief rival to Gainsborough at around the same time. He paints to a higher clientele. He's not just painting gentry, he's actually going to paint lords and ladies and very, very uh, powerful figures. This guy here, uh, Lord Heathfield, was a, a kind of a British hero of the Seven Years' War. Uh, during the time of American independence, there was fighting all over the world. It wasn't just in America. America was, uh, the war for American independence was actually a, a smaller battle of a much larger war and uh, push for power between the continental powers. And so he was actually the commanding officer of Gibraltar. And for three years, I think, he held off a siege of Gibraltar. Uh, amazing. And so you see him here. He is... Uh, next to a cannon that is pointing down. He's on a tall rock. Uh, there's uh, smoke from the fires of battle around him. And yet he's standing here just perfectly calm. <laughs> you know, there are cannons and mortars all around him and smoke from the battle that frame his face. But he looks very dignified. And here he is holding the key, kind of tapping the key in the palm of his hand, like, yep, yeah, not giving this up. Uh, so he became something of a, of a national hero for uh, enduring this terrible siege. But everything about him speaks, you know, dignity, resolve, very much uh, enlightenment ideas. Some of his other portraits deal very strongly with these kind of enlightenment ideas. He was famous for painting uh, these women, some of who were mistresses, some of which who were, uh, you know, uh, powerful women in British society. But he would paint them as uh, classical illusions. This is uh, Mrs. Abington as a comic muse. You can see here she holds a mask. Masks were used in classical plays in antiquity. Notice also that we have the mask also carved into the base here. And we have a figure here, a classical figure, standing on a plinth with books. This is meant to ind indicate her learning. So comedy in classical uh, playwriting uh, oftentimes was satirical and actually was very pointed. If you ever read Aristophanes, Aristophanes loved to make fun of politicians, philosophers, all kinds of levels of society. So it's not just farce. It's not just, you know, jokes for the sake of it. Uh, and so this actually has something of a serious import. She is has a bit of a smile, and that's part of the point. I also love how her foot jauntily kicks up. Uh, she is there as a muse, but you could see this also as being very serious. This one's uh, Mrs. Siddons. Mrs. Siddons is this, oh my gosh, you could go into so much. Uh, so many of these characters have just uh, completely full lives. But here she is depicted as the tragic muse. 
So a muse itself is a classical illusion. It is a story. Uh, the muses are the attendants to Apollo. Apollo is the god of the arts. And so these are the, the individuals who inspire the poets, the writers, the scientists, etc. And so you have muses of comedy, and that's what you know, Mrs. Abington is depicted as, and Siddons is depicted as uh, the tragic muse. And so we have dark and foreboding classical figures there. Uh, and she herself is there uh, looking wistfully into the distance. But again, strong classical illusions. And she was, in many cases, a literal muse to many artists and many poets and figures uh, at the time. She got around, shall we say. Uh, but one of my favorites is going to be Angelica Kaufman. Angelica Kaufman uh, was a Swiss painter who was active predominantly in London and Rome. And one of the few female artists of the time who was highly noted and very, very successful. And she's really noted for her neoclassicism. You can really see her neoclassicism in her work. Uh, whereas even Joshua Reynolds is going to have some of that you know, Rococo delicacy and busyness, she is going to have much more solid line. She's going to have much more detailed uh, paintings and portraits. She's not going to feel the need to fill up her backgrounds with detail and noise just because it's required. She's actually going to let a blank space be an empty space. Oh my gosh, the return of negative space. What a classical idea. You gotta love it. She paints herself here and paints herself next to a bust portrait of Pallas Athena. This is the goddess of wisdom. How much more classical could you get? So, but she's also the goddess of craft. People don't remember this. She is the goddess of craft. And so the illusion here is that she herself is a goddess of wisdom. She is a goddess of craft and boy, does Angelica deserve that title because her stuff is just perfect. Here's one of my favorite paintings. Again, I can only talk about some of, a few of the best paintings, but this painting, I think, demonstrates the neoclassical revolution in, in perfect detail. First of all, let's talk about it technically. Uh, notice that we finally have something like space. We have depth. Oh my gosh, we have empty and negative space. You have a blank wall. How how wonderful it is to look at a blank wall now. I mean, you know, after you look at the busyness of the Rococo where every single leaf is painted, every single, you know, cloud is just a mess of curlicues. It, it just feels, you feel relief. You feel, you know, you're almost, Rococo pushes you to this point of exhaustion with its busyness. And now these paintings are saying, no, you can breathe. There's some space. I love it. So there's not as much emphasis on surface detail. She's gone back to Poussin's line where everything is painted very clearly, very sharply, thin layers, delicate brush strokes that you can't see. So all of this is very clear. Look at the architecture. The architecture is dressed down. The figures are all obviously in classical dress togas. Uh, and her eye for detail and her antiquarianism is just perfect. This toga on the young boy here is hung perfectly. He has a bula on his neck. Neck. This was a detail that was common to Roman sculpture. Young boys wore a little amulet to protect them from harm. So the details of the fashion, the details of the dress, the details of the architecture, not only are they dressed down, clear, uh, neoclassical, ordered, but they're also accurate, so mm, just perfect, Angelica. But what's even better is the story. Uh, the story is a story that comes out of the early history of Rome, and it's the story of Cornelia. Cornelia goes on to be the mothers of two uh, very prominent figures in the history of the Roman Republic, uh, and they go on to become very influential uh, leaders in the Roman Republic. Uh, but she herself was a considerable figure and was a political figure. You can't underestimate these Roman matriarchs. They really uh, did wield enormous power, and not just through their sons, but through their whole houses. And Cornelia was regarded as one of these very wise, prominent, uh, motherly figures. Uh, motherly in, in the sense of both, you know, a good mother, but also in the sense that she was the mother of a, a political family. Uh, so really a, an incredible kind of Prototype, And I think it's really amazing that this is one of the figures that Angelica chose. So the story here is a pretty straightforward story. Cornelia is going about her business. She's walking in the Roman Forum. 
Uh, she's doing her shopping and everything else. And she comes across one of her friends, and her friend looks at Cornelia. You can see her looking at Cornelia. And Cornelia is dressed very modestly. She isn't wearing very elaborate clothing. She isn't wearing any jewelry. She's not blinged out and dressed to the nines. Uh, and you can see that that is, the, in fact, the way that uh, Cornelia is depicted. And her friend, holding up her jewelry here that you can see, says, well, why, Cornelia, where are your treasures? That is, where's your jewelry? Hey, girl, why aren't you dressed up, man? Or maybe they're going to go clubbing later and she wanted her. I don't know. Uh, so she says to she says to Cornelia, where are your treasures? Where is all your bling? Where is all your jewelry? And Cornelia, Cornelia comes back with uh, the, the, the greatest smack back uh, of all times. And she looks, she points to her children and says, my children are my treasures. Which is just a great way of talking shade back to her friend. It says, you're all considered, you know, here you are with all your jewelry. If she was in the modern day, she'd probably be uh, an Instagram influencer. But the real power is in your children and raising your children. And so notice that the children are carrying books and scrolls to show that they're educated. Um, the older son leads the younger son by the hand to show that they are kind, but also firm, etc. She leads her uh, daughter firmly by the hand. Uh, the daughter seems a little more interested in, in her friend's jewelry box, but the idea being that the real sources of power are a mother's influence, a mother's uh, educating of her children, and that your real treasure is the legacy that you leave behind in your children. And of course, that's true for her because her children go on to be very, very powerful and prominent rulers. So great, great example of how to throw shade in the, the Roman period. But it's a fabulous example of again, neoclassicism, of this valuing reason above, you know, show. You know, it's, it's substance over style. And it's a classical story, comes out of classical history, Roman history. So it works really, really well. It brings all these ideas of neoclassicism together. One of the best examples of, of how things have really changed. So this is the antithesis to Fragonard's swing. And it, remarkably, they're painted not very far apart, but it shows just how dramatically neoclassicism has said, yeah, we're done with the Rococo uh, sugar high. We're, 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 we're coming down. We're uh, eating our Wheaties. We're eating our kale chips. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna do a cleanse and get back on the program. Uh, another female artist that emerges at this time is uh, Vigie Lebrun, who is a fascinating character. And she's important because she's one of the first female artists to be added to the French Academy. So remember, the Academy of Painters and Sculptors, founded by Louis XIV. The, this is the new way that painters are being trained. They're not going to, well, they're still, they're still guilds and apprentices, but they're mostly going to be trained up through the Academy. And if you had achieved a certain level of mastery in your life, you could apply to the academy, uh, but you also could become a master at the academy. And she was admitted to the academy as a master uh, and as a teacher. Uh, she was denied for a long time, but she had a very powerful woman in her back pocket, uh, another powerful woman, Marie Antoinette. And she was the court painter to Marie Antoinette. She was Marie Antoinette's favorite, uh, favorite painter. And so when the queen says, uh-uh, girlfriend, you're uh, not going to get uh, you know, kicked out of the academy, you're going to get admitted to the academy, she gets put in. Uh, and what's interesting is that once she's there, everyone acknowledges that she deserved to be there. So we see that even though uh, there were French tastes for the Rococo, we see a much more reserved background, a much more orderly. There's architecture, there's distance, there's depth, this sense of composition that comes out of here. Marie Antoinette, oh my gosh, how to feel about Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette is the most maligned woman uh, in French history, and she really doesn't deserve it. First of all, she's not even French. She was Austrian, uh, and she was raised strict Catholic. Uh, you know, she was betrothed to the French king. She really didn't have a choice, and the French king had many mistresses because he was French and the king. Uh, but, and it's interesting that she comes into this into a, she, because of her station, she's born into a life of, of wealth and power, and she indulges in that for a while. As a young queen, she would, you know, pretend to be a peasant, but she would, you know, even make jewelry for her cows so she could play in the, the garden at Versailles. Uh, but as the French Revolution comes on, she really 
understands uh, the seriousness of the situation. Uh, the famous phrase that's accredited to her, we'll let them eat cake, that's supposed to show her that she was clueless, that she had no idea that you know the, the people not only didn't have bread, they didn't have cake. She just assumed that it was a choice. Uh, that's probably not true. Uh, and towards the end of her life, she became much more aware of the situation, and she became a great defender of her children. She saw her future in her children. And so here we have the Dauphin. This is the, the crown prince uh, and her other children. We have an empty crib here. And this is supposedly a reference to a child that she lost uh, in childbirth. And so there are subtle references here. And she is depicted almost like a Virgin Mary figure as the dutiful mother. And this is how she wanted to be seen. I will say this, that when she ultimately met her death at the guillotine, her husband went like a, a squealing stuck pig fighting in uh, the entire time. She walked with dignity to the guillotine and put herself down and the crowd was hushed and shamed into silence because of this. Uh, so, eh, I don't know, sympathy for the devil, if you will. Uh, everybody gives Marie Antoinette uh, too much of a hard time. And I've kind of gone too long, but I really do think that it's uh, Vigie Laurent who really gives the dignity to the state, that, you know, sees past this. I mean, she is the court painter. She's got to make these people look good. Um, but she does bring a dignity to this, and you have to credit that to the artist. So let's talk about neoclassical sculpture. And in the realm of neoclassical sculpture, um, the standout is, of course, going to be Antonio Canova. Uh, Antonio Canova is the last great uh, historical sculptor in the classical style. By the time we move into the 19th century, things are going to change very dramatically. He's also noted for his exquisite craftsmanship and surfaces. Uh, a little bit different than a lot of other artists because he did not work with a lot of apprentices. Um, he chose to work on these sculptures himself. And while he did have apprentices, oftentimes he would, you know, hand things off to an apprentice, but he always came back to do the final treatment himself. Uh, we sometimes think of an artist as, you know, this genius working alone, but a lot of time artists were more like, you know, brands. They were more like companies that I got to produce this many sculptures and if I've got an apprentice who's up to the job, I'll let him finish it off. But Antonio Canova was noted for having this absolute meticulous quality to his works and that really comes from his hands. So the idea of the kind of lone genius really works for him. And he was very much interested, not just in classical subject matter, but in classical style. He did a lot of works that were derived purely from classical mythology. Uh, this is Eurydice and Orpheus, for example. This is this story. Orpheus is the great, well, bard, to use the D&D &D reference. He is the great singer and poet of uh, Greek myth. He is so good that he can make trees weep. That's how amazing his music is. Uh, but of course, his wife dies and is taken to the underworld, and then he goes really emo. I mean, like, way more than My Chemical Romance. And he gets so emo that all of nature is weeping and crying, and the gods are like, oh my gosh, enough, we can't deal with this. So they make a deal with Hades, saying, you know, you've got to let his wife come back to the, to the land of the living. So Hades tells Orpheus, he says, tell you what, I'll make you a deal. If you can, I, you have to leave the world, uh, you have to leave the underworld, and you cannot look back. If you look back... I will take your wife from you. But if you keep going, she will follow you all the way to the land of living. But you can't look back until you get to the land of living. So Orpheus agrees to this deal, and all the way silently he walks to the, to the out of the underworld, but he begins to wonder if he's being conned. He begins to wonder if he's been, uh, you know, tricked. And so just before he's about to step into the land of the living, he looks back. And sure enough, she was there as a shade. And so this is the terrible moment where he gives the ultimate forehead slap uh, and face palm because he realizes, oh, I, you know, and here she is being pulled down. You can see the hand reaching up out of the darkness to pull her back uh, because he looked back at the wrong time. You can see their dismay. It's a wonderful, powerful group. He really borrowed a lot from classical prototypes. This is his version of the Three Graces. The Three Graces are attendant goddesses. They are goddesses of the gifts of the graces that are given to mankind and they are attendants to the goddess um, Venus or Aphrodite and they are often shown uh, in groups holding apples and this is borrowed from a classical prototype here's a Roman example 
that shows the three together in an embrace. They're often seen embraced or dancing. Here they've lost their heads. Here he shows a little bit more tenderness uh, than perhaps the Roman example would be with the hand curving around, but you can see how he's borrowing on these prototypes. They have these very strong aquiline profiles, what we call a Greek profile. So he's borrowing on these classical prototypes, but enlivening a little bit. Neoclassicism is not a slavish copy of the past, it's an interpretation of the past. Oftentimes he would work out these compositions in what are known as bozzettos. Bozzettos are quick clay sketches that he would do. And I actually think his bozzettos are, are sometimes more compelling than his finished sculptures, because he would work out quickly in clay, and then he would scale these up to plaster models, and then transfer the plaster model into a marble carving. Uh, but they give a sense of his thinking, they give a sense of how he composes things. Uh, he really has this wonderful uh, dynamic, but light touch. This, of course, uh, brings him to the attention of the many most prominent individuals of the era. And so he ends up carving busts and portraits of kings and queens, the most important being Napoleon. Uh, Napoleon is himself Corsican, so he's not strictly French, but he becomes the uh, first uh, the general and then ultimately the emperor of France. And Canova has here depicted him, and he has given him this broad, thick neck and this very strong profile. Uh, you can clearly make out the features of Bonaparte, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, but at the same time, he has given it this classical gloss. He looks very much, especially the hair, the hair here looks very much like the hair of a Julius Caesar or an Augustus from the Roman period. So he is bringing in these references, these classical references, saying that Napoleon is the equal to a Caesar or an Augustus. Uh, he even gets a commission to do Napoleon's sister. So Napoleon's sister marries into the Borghese family in Italy uh, because all of these royal families are intermarried and her husband uh, hires Canova to do a portrait of her and what better portrait than you can you have done of your wife than to make her look like the goddess Venus. Uh, so he has this wonderful depiction of uh, Paulina uh, Bonaparte, or Paulina Borghese, as Venus Victrix, this Venus uh, the victor. She holds an apple, she's semi-draped, you know, uh, and she's this wonderful, again, you can recognize the features, but she's been very much classicized with a stronger Greek profile and all of these features. Now, this is, this is where I have to share a personal story because uh, I've lived in Rome, I've, I've been to all of these places, I've seen them, they're really amazing. This gallery um, is the Galleria uh, Borghese. This is where many of the statues from uh, Bernini wound up. So remember those statues of Bernini, of Apollo and Daphne and Hades and Persephone and, and David? Uh, all of those beautiful Baroque statues are also in this gallery. And so people would go by those statues and you can get really close to them and they were just absolutely dazzling. Uh, but to show you how Canova could really convey surface on a level that no one else could, uh, this statue demonstrates that better. When you are in the presence of this statue, uh, it looks like silk. These pillows actually look like silk. They actually look soft. So as people would go up to the Bernini statues and go, oh my gosh, that's amazing, uh, they would actually couldn't help themselves. They would have to reach out and touch the cushion just to see if it was marble or not. And so there was one corner on this cushion right here where you could reach over from the rope and touch it. And it was so grimy because everybody had been touching it for, oh my gosh, decades. So when I was there in the 1990s, you could see all the, the, the fingerprints on this thing from people who couldn't help it. They just couldn't believe it wasn't silk they couldn't believe it wasn't a silk cushion so they had to reach over and touch it it was so incredibly grimy it was so funny uh so that's a real testament to the skill of the artist that you know uh all the other ones people were dazzled but this one was so dazzling in its surface that people just couldn't believe their eyes they had to touch it with their hands to see if it was stone or not uh, now, that was in the 90s. Since then, there's been a whole cleaning and restoration. This image is post-restoration. So they cleaned off all the dirty fingerprints and they moved the rope back 10 feet <laughs> so that you couldn't do that. So you can't get anywhere close enough to reach over the little velvet rope and, you know, try to squeeze the cushion. 
Uh, but I always remembered that, and uh, it's because his surfaces are just amazing. They're just incredible. And unlike uh, classical statues, uh, statues from the Greek and Roman period were not finished to this level or degree. That's because they were painted. So there's no sense in finishing it to that kind of level of polish if you're going to uh, paint them anyway. But since the Renaissance, there was this preference for white marble, and especially uh, Johann Joachim uh, Winkelmann, uh, this German art historian, really cemented this preference for white marble statuary. And so they started finishing these to a degree that they had never finished them before, even in the Baroque period. So they have this incredible glossy surface. I mean, look at her skin. It looks wet. It looks like she just, you know, got up out of the bath. Um, and that's that's really, a, a, you know, Canova and his working on it. Which will bring us to this statue. This is the statue I'm going to end on from Canova. This is actually one of his earlier statues that cemented his reputation, but I still think it's by far one of the most powerful statues ever, ever created. This is Psyche being revived by Cupid's Kiss. So again, a classical story. Uh, this is the story of Psyche and Cupid, or Psyche and Eros, if you prefer the Greek. Uh, and it's the only story with a happy ending in all of Greek mythology. They all end in a terrible way, and this is the only one that actually ends on a positive note. We'll get to that in a minute. But just to start off, just look at the composition of this thing. So Psyche is actually the heroine of the story. She is the agent who actually does most of the action. We have this wonderful sweeping line, and I love how their arms intertwine. Uh, you can see that in this detail here how they intertwine, uh, leaning over it, of just having finished this kiss, creating all of this circular motion. But I also love how his leg runs up into his wing and the wing runs down into her body. So compositionally, in terms of the details of the composition and the surface, there's no superior work of art. It's just absolutely lovely to look at, and lovely to look at from almost every angle. This one does have a predominant view. Unlike Bernini and, and Baroque statues that you can look from any angle, this one is most satisfying from kind of this side. So it does have a, a kind of uh, preferential view, but still just absolutely gorgeous. What I love about this is it's also another demonstration of Enlightenment thinking. The story is chosen here not by accident. It is a, a deliberate choice on the part of Canova. So to explain this, I have to tell the story of Psyche and Eros, uh, Eros or Cupid, etc. So the story is that Psyche is this beautiful woman, and she is one of the most beautiful women in the world. She's so beautiful that she actually causes Aphrodite, or Venus, the goddess of love, to just go mad with envy. And this is, in fact, the origin of many of the, the tropes that we know from fairy tales. The whole story of Snow White and the beautiful queen, the evil queen, that comes right out of the story of Eros and Psyche. So many stories, Beauty and the Beast, uh, East of the Sun, West of the Moon, Snow White, all of those, and Cinderella, so many of them have their root in this story, as, you, as you'll hear this. So Psyche is, is so beautiful that Aphrodite is overcome with envy, and she sends her son, Cupid, or Eros, uh, this winged figure, to shoot her with a lead arrow. Everybody forgets that Cupid can shoot you with a golden arrow to make you fall in love, but he can also shoot you with a lead arrow <laughs> to make ev everybody hate you. Uh, and so he, a really vindictive, nasty thing for the goddess of love to do. So she sends her son to sh shoot her with a lead arrow so everyone will hate her, but he refuses. Uh, when he gets there, he's so overcome by her beauty that he refuses and then he arranges to have a marriage with her but of course the marriage has to be in secret so he uh, finds a way uh, to have him married off so all she knows is she is being taken to a far off kingdom where she is going to be wed to a husband that she can never see and he will come to her only in darkness only after they have been wed uh, but by and by, even though she never sees him, he only comes at night in darkness, she comes to fall in love with him. And more than anything, she wishes to see who her husband is in this mysterious land and, and uh, palace that she's been spirited away to. 
Uh, and so what she does is she takes a candle. The candle, of course, is made out of tallow. That's animal fat. And as she leans in to see it, she notices, holy crap, I am married to the god of love. I'm married to Cupid uh, himself. Uh, how she never felt the wings, I don't know. I'm not going to ask that question. <laughs> but she drips tallow on him. And this awakens him. And he's like, oh, no, because now you know the secret will get out and my mother will be furious with me. And, of course, um, Aphrodite, Venus, is absolutely furious that her son married this beautiful woman instead of making everybody hate her. And so Cupid is taken away to a far kingdom and they're split. And this is where the story actually begins, because Psyche then goes on this journey. She says, you know what? I love him. I want to go find him. And she goes on an endless series of adventures. It's really a great story. She goes on an endless series of adventures to go and find her husband. And she does all these incredible heroic things to actually do it. She even uh, faces death and goes to the underworld to find the secret of where he is. Eventually, she does uh, successfully save him, but not before she nearly succumbs to death. And that's when Cupid rushes in and Cupid or Eros rushes in and revives her with this kiss. So again, this idea of the prince reviving the maiden with a kiss is, is, goes all the way back to this story. But she's the real hero. She's the person who, who does all the action uh, to undertake this. And eventually, Aphrodite, Venus, is so overcome by their true love, she says, well, okay, I guess she's not a bad daughter-in-law. What woman doesn't have problems with her mother-in-law? And you thought your mother-in-law was the worst. Oh my gosh. Uh, but she allows it. She says, okay, it will happen. And they actually have a happy ending. Now, uh, so it's a great story. It's a, it's a great, great, great story uh, where the, the woman is the hero and where she's the one that ultimately succeeds. But it's also a happy ending, which is rare in Greek mythology. But why is it a perfect reflection of this idea of rational philosophy in the age of enlightenment well you might get a clue from their names so cupid in greek his name is eros and eros of course is where we get the root for words like erotic eros represents passion love lust those kind of strong vital sexy emotions those kind of things and but psyche psyche is from the greek word for the soul or the mind and of course, you can see that, hear that in things like psychiatry, psychology. Uh, that's the root word for the mind. And so what we see here is a, a wonderful interplay of the role between the mind and the passion, the spirits, the passions uh, of the body. And the idea here is that, yeah, passion is great. I mean, we all we love sex. <laughs> we love music. We love passion. Who doesn't? But those things have to be subjected to the mind. Those things only reach their full potential, their true beauty, uh, if they are subject to the mind, to the will, to the spirit, to the, to the soul. And those kind of things are embodied in the personification of psyche. And so, uh, and this was true even in ancient Greek mythology, that was the understanding of this myth, but it was especially true in the Age of Enlightenment. So the Age of Enlightenment is, yeah, yeah, let's have this wonderful, beautiful, passionate art but let's keep it ordered. That's very much a perfect metaphor for the art of the neoclassical age and this wonderful, wonderful sculpture. Sometimes these classical metaphors just mwah, work. Chef's kiss, they just perfectly work like this one. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're kind of clunky. And I just want to look at a couple other examples to give you a sense of that. This is uh, a very famous statue of the American founding father, uh, George Washington. Uh, this one is done by a French sculptor. This one actually sits in the Virginia State Capitol. Here we see George Washington, and he is dressed in contemporary dress. Uh, but notice that he has this wonderful contrapposto pose. Uh, he has, uh, you know, a kind of classical air about him. So in this case... The artist, the neoclassical artist, is taking these neoclassical ideas and applying them to a contemporary subject matter. You may wonder, what on earth is this colossal bundle of sticks that he is leaning on against? This is actually the fast gaze. Now, the fast gaze is a feature of, again, classical history. So, long story short, uh, Rome was divided up into regions by tribe. 
and the leader of each of these tribes was called a tribune and each tribune had a staff that kind of represented his authority but these staves would be bound together into a bundle of sticks around an axe head called a fasces and this bundle of sticks with an axe head would be carried over the head of the consuls the consuls consuls were the rulers of the roman senate and so it was a symbol of political unity you had these lictors who would bury the, bear this symbol of political unity that all the tribes and all the tribunes were united behind the consuls so it became a symbol of political unity so this classical illusion here uh plucked from the past makes perfect sense for George Washington because George Washington was regarded as the pater patriae, the father of the country, as the person, he was the indispensable member. He was the person who, amidst all the fighting at the Constitutional Convention, um, got people to sit down. You know, when the, when the um, Declaration of Independence was uh, being drafted, they realized you know, none of this is worth anything if we don't have somebody commanding the troops in the field. And so George Washington left. He wasn't there for the drafting of the Declaration of Independence because he went to go be the Supreme Commander. And when the country was falling apart at the times of the, of the Articles of Confederation and they needed a new constitution, he came in and pretty much he was the indispensable man. If he hadn't agreed to be president, the whole thing probably would have fallen apart and we'd all be, you know, a bunch of squabbling different countries uh you know heck in utah where i teach would probably still be part of mexico so it would be a very different history uh whether that's good or bad depends on your point of view <laughs> so uh there you go so you can see how even in contemporary figures this neoclassicism was being drawn into it but it doesn't always work as well as you might think it sometimes gets a little clunky uh, and this is another example. This is also George Washington, but as you can see, he looks quite different than this George Washington. Uh, this one's actually a little bit later. Uh, this was at the tail end of neoclassicism when I think things were getting a little bit silly. Uh, so here's George Washington. I don't know. I don't definitely. He's a CrossFit guy, man. Look at that physique. Wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, what's going on in this picture? You have to be asking yourself, uh, I know the Founding Fathers, uh, they liked to drink, but uh, I didn't think they had toga parties. So obviously, uh, this is not how George Washington dressed. Here, uh, Houdon has tried to depict him in contemporary dress as a man of considerable girth. Here, uh, Horatio Greenow has decided, who's an American sculptor, has decided to depict him in this incredible physique, dressed in classical dress, uh, handing back a sword. Uh, what's going on here it looks really kind of odd to have george washington's head kind of photoshopped onto this you know kind of um arnold schwarzenegger body oh gosh arnold schwarzenegger hasn't been hot in years who's hot now who has the really great physique uh chris hemsworth yeah to see have him you know uh photoshopped onto this uh uh you know thor uh chris hemsworth body and i mean uh uh pre-endgame thor not endgame thor but infinity war thor anyhow so what's going on here? Well, again, this is classical illusion. This is a reference to the classical past. They were so into this idea of reclaiming the classical past and the neoclassical era, they sometimes did silly things like this. This one, I also have to get a little bit into classical history. One of the things that George Washington is really known for is that he was one of the few people that was given the opportunity to be king. They actually thought about making him king of America. And they thought we should have a king. And he said, no, there should be no kings. And he actually turned it down. And King George III said, if, if he really truly did that, then he's the best, you know, he's the best man that ever lived. And he did. And people all around the world remarked at this. And they called him a modern day Cincinnatus. So who the heck is Cincinnatus? Well, back again in the days of the Roman Republic, uh, Rome would enter into times of crises, and they needed to invest all political and military power into a single person that was called a dictator. That was the actual term. And sometimes this turned out okay, but most of the time it didn't. Most of the time, when you, when you give a person a title like dictator, they tend to keep it, uh, and they tend not to give it up, and it was a disaster. But there were a few men who they gave this power uh, in a time of emergency, and then once they had it 
they gave it back. And Cincinnatus was one of these characters. So he took control of all the powers of the Roman state, and then when he was done, he gave the power back to the people and back to the Republic, and he went back to his farm. That's exactly what George Washington did. George Washington was essentially the ruler of America, the supreme commander of you know, all the military forces, but when the war was over, he gave up the power and he went back to his farm. And then they had to beg him to come back to be president. Uh, to put the whole thing back together again, but he served for two terms. He could have served for the rest of his life, but he said, nope, I'm only going to serve two terms, and I'm going to quit. And that was the tradition. Uh, this was before term limits existed. That didn't happen until the 20th century uh, for presidents, which, thank goodness. Anyhow, uh, 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 nope, don't get political. Bad, bad art historian. Don't. Okay, so he he turned this power over. And so this is where, you know, Greenow gets this idea. He depicts him as Cincinnatus. And of course, since Cincinnatus is a Roman figure, he's going to be wearing sandals, you know, Roman drapery. He's going to be, you know, semi-nude because that's a way of showing the heroic nude figure. And he's going to be returning his sword, returning his commission with the other hand in the air. And it's a beautiful sculpture. It just seems completely incongruous that, you know, to have... You know, George Washington's, you know, 18th century head on top of a, you know, a second century BC body just doesn't really work. And it shows how there are fault lines in neoclassicism, and we run up against these fault lines pretty hard, like a truck into a wall. And this explains why, by the middle of the 19th century, this just isn't cutting it anymore. And it gives a little bit of an explanation of why people started to move into realism and modernism and other ideas because really neoclassicism had run out of steam and had become a kind of, had become a little bit silly. We'll talk more about that, but we'll wait until the second time. I've talked enough this time. We'll wait until the second half of the class to get there uh, and we'll pick that up in a bit. So thanks for hanging with me again. Remember, the long message, the long, long message of history is that humans suck, but we can get better. <laughs> I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.